I was really, really excited for Cyberpunk 2077's launch. And so when it came out with all its bugs and missing features and even really underwhelming AI, I was thoroughly disappointed. And yet strangely, I still found myself going back to it for some reason. And I think it might have a lot to do with what I want to share with you guys in this video. Hey guys, Morphologist here, and welcome back to an Architect Reviews. For the first time on my channel, I'm reviewing a game that isn't Star Citizen. We're taking a look at Cyberpunk 2077's Night City, a Metabolist Architect's wet dream. I'm gonna really try to keep this video as concise as possible, taking you guys through some of the coolest parts of the city and some of the things that I've personally noticed in my 32 hour so far playthrough. But I'm gonna be honest with you guys, sometimes I might trail off a little bit in this video because it's just so hard to cover something of this scale. There is so much depth and detail in Night City that it would take me probably the better part of the next year or two to make a video on every aspect of the space. So for the sake of all of our sanities, I'm gonna to try to focus first on something that is a little bit more digestible for the introduction. And that would be V's apartment, and then we're gonna go more into the other aspects of the city. And I'll explain why we're starting with V's apartment shortly. But if you guys like this video and you think I deserve it by the end, make sure you don't forget to hit that like and subscribe button with the bell icon because it really helps me out and helps grow the channel. In the lore of Cyberpunk, V lives in a place called a Mega Block, which is a gigantic building housing thousands of people, whose architecture was likely inspired by the work of metabolist architects in the 1970s and 80s, such as architect Kishu Kurokawa's Nakagin Capsule Tower in Tokyo, which still stands to this day, but also likely inspired by Hong Kong social housing projects, which feature very similar architecture on the interior. I think though that you're gonna find through the duration of this video that Hong Kong served as great inspiration for a lot of architecture in Night City, but we'll go over more of that later once we get to the rest of the city itself. I think the reason why writers often use these pieces of architecture as set pieces for their stories is because they often instill a sense of oppression in the user, a feeling that the user is only a cog in the machine, one of many in thousands, just another face. And that's pretty fitting for the world of cyberpunk. Even the choice of the freight-like elevator is telling, as it speaks of the occupant being more of a commodity, uh, an object as opposed to an actual human being. Everything about this architecture is meant to instill something subconscious in the user, and I find that to be incredibly compelling straight from the start. The interior atrium space of the Mega Block also is quite fitting in its oppressive feeling. Light seems far away, most of what you experience here is artificial. Years of grime cover every surface, and haphazardly installed electrical and HVAC systems speak of a lack of care of the visual quality of the space. More impactfully though, there is a sense that there is a lack of care of the occupant's health and safety. Missing banisters, haphazardly reinforced walls and structure really do give you the sense that the occupants of this building are very low on the socioeconomic ladder of cyberpunk society. This space really does tell me that CD Projekt Red did their homework and really spent a lot of time on the environment design to set the tone for the rest of the story. It's part of the reason why I keep coming back to this game despite all the bugs that I've found in it that can take me out of the immersion because the architecture itself is incredibly well done and very, very immersive. But what about V's apartment? This is where the illusion falls apart just a little bit. It's not to say that this space isn't well designed, rather, I think it is and it's very fitting for the world of cyberpunk. It's actually more about the size of V's apartment. The main program of V's apartment, and that's like the usable areas, like the bedroom, the bathroom, etc., are shoved to the periphery of the apartment, which makes the center space underutilized. It takes up far more space than it needs to or probably should. Even more strange is that when you examine those peripheral spaces, you'll discover that those spaces are very well and compactly designed, which again is in contrast to the large open space in the center. 
It seems to me that it could have been better utilized to make some of these peripheral spaces a little bit more comfortable to inhabit. And that's really besides the point, because the reason why I think that this isn't exactly correct for the world of cyberpunk is because the fact that they've built a megastructure like this mega block means that space is at a premium, and so you wouldn't probably see a low-end apartment being this big. You'd likely see it more closely resemble the apartments you'd find in Hong Kong, which are pretty tiny and often only have enough space for just a bed and a table. And this, mind you, is on the salary of somebody who is earning 30, 40, 50,000 a year. I really, really like the commercial aspect to the space though. The fact that they've shoved a vending machine into your personal area really talks about the intrusion of commercialism into the personal sphere. Focusing now more on the individual aspects of the apartment, I really like the view out of his apartment. This is a great way to introduce players to the world of cyberpunk. And I also really like the shutters that you can open and close. The animation's really well done and I like how you can see a little bit of light peeking through even though they're fully closed. But I also want to point out to you guys just how intentional the designers here with the framing. You can look just to the right of V's apartment and see a super high-end apartment. This isn't an accident. I suspect that they wanted to juxtapose a V situation with the rest of the world to emphasize the stratification of society between the haves and have-nots. This is another great example of how architecture can tell a story and how CD Projekt Red is keenly aware of this. V's sleeping area is very capsule-like, again akin to something that you'd see perhaps in Japan in capsule hotels, so I really like that design of the space, which is followed through with with all of the spaces in V's apartment that are on the periphery, such as in the bathroom that we've already gone through. One of the strange things you might notice though is that in place of a kitchen, there is a workspace, which was an interesting choice. I would have expected a small apartment like this to have its own small kitchenette, but Instead, we only have some shelving and, again, a very large open space that seems underutilized. If I were to redesign the space, I probably would have introduced a small kitchenette with a small eating area. I think that would have made it feel a little bit more correct. I think that the real success of this space though here for the designer is in the lounge area of the apartment, which, not speaking of its really 80s coloring scheme, well utilizes both the floor and ceiling plane, elements that are far too often overlooked by even more seasoned architects and designers. Rather than being tacked on, amenities are actually integrated into this space, which again is the mark of a accomplished designer. The bench itself is sunk into the floor and part of the design, the entertainment unit that hangs from the ceiling has a connection with the ceiling, and even the storage spaces are well crafted, which have communicated to me that the designer on some level understood that spaces should be designed like gloves, they should fit the user perfectly, and I think that they've done a really fantastic job with this space, with some small little quirks. One of them being that there's a space just behind the curved couch that has no shelf. All I would need to do is just add a little bit of a table there and it would be perfect. Well, the color scheme isn't my thing. It fits the world of cyberpunk and if I could change the material set, I'd like to have this in my own bachelor pad. Seems like a pretty cool space to hang out. Just adjacent to the lounge area though, is V's storage for weaponry. It's a really cool space, and architecturally speaking it's really nothing to write home about, but it's cool to have it, and it does again talk about the world of cyberpunk and the importance of having weaponry in a world where everybody's got a gun and you gotta fend for yourself. But you won't spend too much time in Cyberpunk 2077 actually in V's apartment. You're gonna spend it out there in the world. The world of Night City. And that's where we're going next. Some of the key things that CD Projekt Red were clearly trying to instill on users here were feelings of density and depression. Feeling that you're again a cog in the machine, not just from where you live, but the streets on which you walk. One of the first things I would examine when designing a futuristic world where corporations have taken over is how regulations would be affected, and the world of cyberpunk does this phenomenally well. What you might not know about architecture if you're not in the trade is that we have a lot of regulations which limit the shape and form of a building, such as setbacks, maximum area a space can take up on a given plot, etc. And even things like materiality. 
In a world where government no longer has any power and everything is ruled by money, you wouldn't have setbacks anymore. Public spaces would be a rarity and you'd often find structures built directly over other structures for the sake of maximizing the commercial profitability of the spaces that you create by maximizing their size. It's this exact mindset that created the modern glass skyscraper. This approach to urban design would pretty much eliminate master plans, as everybody would be fighting amongst one another for getting their building as big as they possibly could, completely transforming the world into a network of overlapping, intersecting structures that barely leaves enough room for regular people to occupy. As corporations capitalized on spaces, roads would then be cut off and become weaving and convoluted, creating a catastrophe of ground-based navigation, but in Cyberpunk's world it doesn't matter because the rich can just fly around. One of the best places we can examine as precedent for how a space would look in the event that spaces are just haphazardly developed would be in places like Osaka. The reason why it looks this way isn't actually because of modern development. It's a leftover from the feudal era of Japan where people built kind of where they felt like. There was no master plan for a road system. As old structures were replaced with new commercial structures, the old road system was too troublesome to replace with a grid system, as it would have intersected many private properties. The result is a road system that is so spaghettified that people who've lived there for years still find themselves getting lost on Osaka City streets. A world where mega corporations rule the world would in effect be a modern feudalist era. Now I don't know whether or not CD Projekt Red's developers really articulated these ideas when designing this city, but whatever it was that led them to this conclusion successfully created what I think is a accurate depiction of what a future city ruled by corporations might look like. I mean, CD Projekt Red really did their homework. Like here at the Riverwalk, you can see connections with Dotonbori from Osaka with their well-designed public area near the river. I've also seen many examples in Night City of futurist brutalism architecture that you could find here in the real world. Stuff that looks to be inspired by very early examples of communist architecture in Soviet Russia truly exotic and crazy buildings that interlock and overhang. Work that clearly also inspired one of my favorite architects from Japan, Kenzo Tange, whose influence here on cyberpunk is pretty clear. This informed his later metabolist brutalist architecture, like here at the Fuji TV project that he did in Tokyo. Clearly the artists and designers over at CD Projekt Red are paying homage to this time of futurist brutalism. But those aren't the only kind of architecture you'll find. Journeying to some of the more slum areas of Night City and you might find yourself standing amongst buildings that resemble more of the 1930s era of Art Deco architecture in Asia. Well, some areas look like they are straight out of the central business area of Hong Kong. In fact, each district has its own architectural flavor, and I really appreciate that attention to detail to indicate a change of location by the architecture, giving each one a sense of place. Something I often reflect on is missing in our real-world examples of architecture, which all too often fall upon a globalist corporatist style that completely ignores the culture that it resides within. Overall then, despite cyberpunk's bugs, Night City is definitely a place worth visiting and taking time to explore. Around every corner is something new to discover, and it's what's kept me coming back time after time and actually itching to play this game, and also what's caused me to take so much time to even put this together this weekend. I've more often than not found myself going back into the game to get some pickup shots for a certain scene I want to do, only to find myself drawn into something for way more time than I expected to spend. Which is what makes it such a tragic shame that when you pick at the edges of this game, like examining the AI more closely, that it really falls apart. In all honesty, Cyberpunk feels more akin to an alpha game than it does a finished, released title. But their plans to release some DLCs give me hope that they can finish this and polish it to the state that it should have released in. And you better believe I'll be back to take a look at it. 
Thank you guys so much for watching. I hope you enjoyed this episode of An Architect Reviews, and if you did enjoy my first episode outside of Star Citizen, please let me know down in the comment section below. Your feedback is really, really important to me. And of course, if you like this video and you want to see more, don't forget to hit that like and subscribe button and share it with your friends. I'll see you in the next one.